Well, good morning. Uh, this is really exciting. What an amazing way for us to interact and communicate. Um, today's presentation, I wanted to focus on something that could bridge us between um, looking at family and consumer sciences education and really the benefits that we have in extension. And so at some points in the presentation, you will see educators, um, lesson planning and curriculum, but that is what you're doing in a sense in one way or another um, in extension as well. And so um, what I have to share with you is looking at how we can really continue to change the world with family and consumer sciences and the things that you already do in extension through extension have made such an impact for you. So some of this is just going to be supportive and helping you figure out ways to toot your own horn and really talk about the benefits of family and consumer sciences extension. And so the first thing that we need to look at when we're considering education through extension is the curriculum that we use. So whether it's a workshop, whether it's a, a conference that we're organizing, or just an, an opportunity to interact with um, a small group of individuals, what we are presenting to those individuals can connect into the curriculum that we're planning or the activities that we're looking to accomplish with individuals, families, and communities. And in that process, we come up with different strategies that work well for us in communicating the content. So even though the slide says teaching, uh, Extension, we're communicating content, providing resources and information uh, through a variety of means and media to individuals, families, and communities. So um, thinking about those tools that you use for creativity uh, to enjoy the process yourself. I find it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day tasks that we have before us, but how can we truly enjoy being creative with the resources that we have and the connections that we can make with individuals, families, and communities. And technology, this is a great uh, resource that we have utilizing the IVC system, but many of you have iPads and I've seen you use them with amazing skill, but integrating technology, those that we work with want us to use technology. So we have to embrace it in a way that makes sense for our skill levels and not try to be pushed into a new direction that we're not necessarily comfortable with. And so where do we really start in this process of trying to continue to change the world with family and consumer sciences and to communicate our relevance and how we can be useful to to individuals, families, and communities today. And so I've got a lot of ideas that I wanna share with you, some videos, um, books that you might want to look into just to support the work that you already do. So the first one that I came across, and I actually teach a class on campus called Methods for Teaching. And um, last semester I had about 30 students in the class, which is a high number for our methods classes. Um, and this was actually the textbook that I used, and it's called The Third Teacher. And the organization that developed this, it's actually a collaboration between an architecture firm, so designers, and educational consultants, so individuals who focus on um, the process of education. And in this book, they look at how we can use design to transform teaching and learning. So if you look at the resources and the materials that you, that you use, um, are you considering and incorporating design into that process to make it aesthetically pleasing? Because the resources that you're developing are getting out into homes, uh, they're available online, and when people download them, is it going to make them want to continue to download those resources? Sounds like we've got a live mic. Heidi. I've got you logged into the bridge twice. So you've accidentally connected two different pods to the bridge. Could you close one of the pods, please? Or Marilyn, I'm sorry. Marilyn, you're logged in under Heidi.
Marilyn, can you hear me? I think it's quiet now. Okay. Yeah, just keep going. Um, so the pictures that I showed you in the previous slides connect into that design aesthetic and looking at our surroundings, and that's classified as the third teacher. Our environment impacts the educational experience or how individuals perceive family and consumer sciences and their experience. So if we have the space that's appropriate, uh, it helps us to be better teachers. Uh, and one of the things that they come across with is this whole process of, if you are an educator, you are a designer. You're designing the educational experiences for individuals, and we have to take the opportunity to really remake those experiences and look at what, if we're working with youth, they're going to want that technology. They're going to demand that technology. So those are some resources that they've come up with. Another one is, uh, called the Sketch Note Handbook. And this is a really fun book uh, that I've been using quite a bit, even just for my planning process and looking at the opportunity to connect words and ideas to sketches. Uh, I find that when I'm working with individuals, uh, multitasking is very common. Wanting to sketch out or doodle while maybe a lecture is happening. And so now we can empower people, individuals to continue those sketches and to jot down ideas. So taking the napkin concept and empowering individuals to integrate that into uh, their learning experience. So then the takeaway is really interesting and when we revisit these notes and see these sketches it can get us re uh, build that excitement level again which i think is really exciting so i've got my first clip to share with you on sketch noting so and i'm going to give you an opportunity to um sketch as we go through the presentation. So here's the first clip, really looking at how we can use something as basic as note taking to encourage our participants to walk away with the benefits of family and consumer sciences in their everyday life. I was uh, inspired by Conan O'Brien, but this never saw the light of day until now. <laughs> I really like the quote that he had at the end of his show where he talked about nobody getting what they want in life. Well, sketch notes are these things that I discovered about three years ago. I was a pretty hardcore note taker, and I took notes by hand, and I wrote. I tried to capture every detail of meetings. Unfortunately, it was really stressful, and I always felt like on the clock and like worried that I'd miss something. And one of the first conferences that I went to was in Chicago, and it was called the Seed Conference, and I decided I would take a small moleskin notebook and a gel pen and that was it. And my focus would be on just the ideas. And I went and I had a lot of fun capturing those. And those turned into sketch notes. They were typography and drawings as well as notes all mixed together. And the idea of stepping back and getting the meta ideas that were being talked about and not every last detail was really refreshing. People that were at the event who saw them really resonated with them and thought they were helpful. 37 Signals actually picked it up on their blog and, and featured it, and that's where I started becoming known for this. And that led to um, the book rework that I did with 37 Signals, because they knew about my sketch noting and my sketching approach. And so I would draw, you know, different ideas and put notes in pencil, just really, really rough, you know, maybe like 15 minutes a sketch. What I then did is... I got my uh, moleskin sketchbook, which is, it has this really heavy paper that can resist heavy inking. The way I designed them was all, were all as little tidbits. So I would draw little bits and pieces and then scan them in and put them together in Photoshop. You can see the different pieces that I did and the typography. So they were all separate. So here we go. So looking at what he's created, those were just his ideas and something that he found to work for himself. And in Family and Consumer Sciences, I find that you all have wonderful ideas that you're coming up with. How do we document and share those ideas? 
Are there opportunities for you to sketch those ideas and share them with your colleagues to develop a model, to incorporate that into an article, um, to get feedback that way, to see what people are really taking away from our workshops and our experiences? So maybe the drawing piece is a little too intense. Um, it might stress you out. So that might not be the best approach for you or some of the individuals in your workshops or activities. So there's another way that we can approach this uh, collecting and gathering of ideas and information. So the next clip focuses on something called smashing. So as you can see in these notebooks, people are gathering life. And just as I was watching that, I was thinking about, so I love to cook, but finding the right recipe of what I'm going to cook during a week Work gets busy, time gets shorter, getting to the grocery store, planning ahead, it doesn't always work out. But if I was able to go to a workshop, sit down with a notebook, and then smash all of my ideas for how I'm gonna get through that week of meals, that would be wonderful. But I'm allowing myself to be creative, get involved in the process, come up with new ideas, share ideas. So it brings that creative opportunity into something that's every day, that's family and consumer sciences. So we can take each of our content areas and allow participants to create, share ideas, and come up with strategies to make life better and simpler. So what I want you to do is to grab your pencil. It looks like many of you have pencils. And as we go through, I'm gonna give you opportunities to sketch. Um, to draw out ideas and plans of how you might implement um, some of the things that I present to you today. But I think first we have to realize that it's important for us in family and consumer sciences to continue the movement. Uh, family and consumer sciences, home economics has been around for a long time and we have the opportunity to continue our programs in a way that they get so strong that everybody wants to participate. Um, we deal with it more in secondary education where potentially some programs are closing um, and not seen as relevant, but it doesn't really take very long to change somebody's mind about the relevancy of family and consumer sciences because we connect to life. So to get us inspired on this lovely Tuesday morning, I want to challenge you to continue to be a part of this movement. And so what better person than a nine-year-old to get us motivated, motivated this morning? I think 
we all need a pep talk. And maybe you've seen this. The world needs you to stop being boring. Yeah, you. Boring is easy. Everybody can be boring, but you're gooder than that. Life is not a game, people. Life isn't a cereal either. Well, it is a cereal. And if life is a game, are we all on the same team? I mean, really, right? I'm on your team. Be on my team. This is life, people. You got air coming through your nose. You got heartbeat. That means it's time to do something. A poem. Two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the road less traveled. It hurt, man! Really bad. Rocks, thorns, and glass. My pants broke. Not cool, Robert Frost. But well, there were the worst two paths. I won't be in the one that leads to awesome. It's like that dude Journey said, don't stop believing unless you dream stupid. Then you should get a better dream. I think that's how it goes. Get a better dream and keep going. Keep going, keep going, and keep going. What Michael Jordan have quit? Well, he did quit. No, he retired. Yeah, yeah, he retired. But before that, in high school, what if he quit when he didn't make the team? He would have never made Space Jam. And I love Space Jam. What will be your Space Jam? What will you create will make the world awesome? Nothing if you keep sitting there. That's why I'm talking to you today. This is your time. This is my time. It's our time. We can make every day better for each other. If we're all on the same team, let's start acting like it. We got work to do. We can cry about it or we can dance about it. We were made to be awesome. Let's get out there. I don't know everything. I'm just a kid. But I do know this. What everybody's doing is to give the world a reason to dance. So get to it. You just did pep talks. Create something that will make the world awesome. I don't know about you, but family and consumer sciences definitely makes me want to dance. And so I think we really have an opportunity to work together and make something even more amazing than we've even considered. And so on the screen, you can see I've provided you with a little overview, a screenshot of a process that I've been experimenting with to develop ideas and refine things that I do on a regular basis. And there are really four steps that we're gonna go through today. And um, the first one, I think it's easier for you to read when I make it larger, is step one, I think, is to refine the process. So what mechanisms, what techniques are we going to use as family and consumer sciences professionals to communicate the content that we uh, have identified as important. And then crafting a vision. What's that unified vision for what we're doing? How can we come together and really support each other so that we're on the same page? And I think that when we look at the courses and our professional practice, um, we want to create programs that are designed to challenge participants to think, create, and ultimately learn this new information to improve their quality of life. And so going back to the beginning here, the profession, looking at family and consumer sciences as a whole, we're right in the center. And we bring together a lot of different experiences and have the potential to integrate content from a across the board, across the map. So if you look, our main content areas, and these are areas that you do workshops and activities for youth and adults, food science, human nutrition, personal family, financial resource management, textiles and clothing, housing and interiors, child development and parenting, human development and family relations. But then on the outside, we reinforce things like biology, chemistry, agriculture. We integrate those areas to accomplish the tax, tasks that we've identified as important. But then from those content areas and from our profession, we can identify social issues. 
that are relevant to individuals, families, and communities. So uh, foods and nutrition. Uh, obesity is something that is at the forefront as an issue that we need to address. So coming up with uh, recipes and uh, physical activity that can help us to be healthy and individuals in our counties to be health healthy. And you're doing workshops that connect to financial management, relationship development. And so we're able to keep our relevancy because of those social issues that we continue to work on and help individuals uh, overcome. But looking at the beginning, we have some amazing foundations. And Ellen Swallow Richards, you know, is someone that I hope you're familiar with who really uh, was a foundational and instrumental individual in our profession and interestingly enough was a chemist. She discovered a mineral, the first woman to graduate from MIT. So she was able to bring that relevance to individuals uh, and start family and consumer sciences or at that time home economics. But there have been so many individuals who have contributed to the success of our profession, whether it's Abraham Lincoln, Carolyn Hunt, Melville Dewey, and I would think it would be important to put your pictures up there as well, because you've made impacts in your counties and um, across the nation, around the world, that people don't even realize, but yet need to have that understanding of what's been accomplished. So how will you continue to use your voice? And if we look at the future, I think that this is a great quote that I came across um, from Ben Franklin. Uh, All mankind is divided into three types of people. Those who are immovable, those that are movable, and those that move. And I think in extension, we move a lot. We're doing a lot of things and really making a difference. And so the next clip, I'm actually going to skip through it because I have some other things that I wanna share with you, but remaking our experiences, and there's a hashtag involved in it. Oh, maybe I'll show you a little bit of it. Taking something that we're familiar with that's maybe considering four white walls, right? Maybe the workshops that you're doing are located in an area that have four basic white walls. And that's sometimes what we have to deal with. But can we remake that experience with a little creativity and maybe a little elbow grease too, so that people want, it's a place for people that they want to come to, they want to experience. For example, on campus, our clothing production labs, they need to be updated. But because there's so much opportunity for creativity, the students flock. They're even there. You can drive by our building and see the lights on at midnight because they're on a project working on something. And yes, they have a deadline, but they want to be there because they can be creative. They can um, express themselves through something hands-on. So remaking your physical environment and seeing what we can do, it doesn't necessarily cost much. My name is Steve Matice. I am a math and science teacher here at Roosevelt Middle School. I have been teaching for about seven years now. Steve had a problem. His classroom was too small for the 36 students who poured in and out every period. And too cramped to accommodate the student-to-student -student collaboration he knew encouraged deeper learning. They're extending this knowledge. When they're working together, they're happier and more positive and more likely to participate. I've got a lot of kids and a lot of desks. Things pile up very quickly. Um, even kids can sort of pile up very quickly in here. And the maneuverability of this room is not always fantastic. Then he met the folks at the Third Teacher Plus, whose job it is to help educators reimagine their learning spaces. See how they all took on the challenge of remaking Steve's classroom to be a home for exploration, creativity, and better communication. Teachers around the country will totally identify with this classroom, an incredible number of kids and limited space. So one of the things we're going to be looking at is how does Steve move around the classroom? I'm Christian Long, and I was a high school English teacher for about 15 years. As a member of the Third Teacher Plus, our job is to create spaces that allow people to be remarkable students, remarkable educators. When people think design, a lot of times they think veneer, they think decorating. Yeah, we want it to look better, but unless we can change and facilitate 
a really productive classroom, then we're not really making a difference. I'm Melanie Kale, and I'm a design and learning strategist at the Third Teacher Plus. We're going into a classroom, identifying things that work and things that could work better, taking $1,000, a designer's eye, a lot of community resources. We try to match the physical classroom environment to teaching and learning goals. And in one weekend, we hopefully realize them. So Stephen, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about this classroom, how it works, how it's laid out. There's very little room to sort of move through the middle, so I kind of stay on the outskirts when I do have to move around. I've got 36 kids, plus backpacks, books, jackets. There's so much stuff just within the aisles. Just trying to get through is, is almost like trying to get through rush hour. In your world here, what, what is crucial that you have up here to be successful in class? Um, I use the Elmo or the overhead a lot just for more direct teaching. The Elmo is a document camera that connects to a projector and projects anything that I'm writing up onto the screen. It's not a big workspace. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, I've got a, a stool here to sort of make. So looking at that short part of the clip, now we don't necessarily have traditional classrooms that we're working at in extension or utilizing, but thinking about that space, is the space you're using for the workshop, for family and consumer sciences, is it communicating your vision for what you want to accomplish with the participants? Is it connecting to um, what the possibilities are in family and consumer sciences? Are there individuals in your community that can assist you in the process of revitalizing that space? That takes time. But what I want you to do, it's time to sketch. So just um, as we're going through the presentation, what is your vision for family and consumer sciences? If you could dream anything for your space, for your teaching, for your participants to experience, what would that be? What does that look like? What's on your list of things that you want to achieve in the next year through family and consumer sciences? So take a minute and drop those things down because really if we don't put it into writing, if we don't get it on a piece of paper, we might move on to our next task and not remember what that was that we were excited about at that point. So we might as well take the opportunity to start that list. So just take a couple seconds and, and write down a few things that connect to your vision for family and consumer sciences and what you'd like to accomplish in the next year. And remember that step one is to really refine our process, what we're already doing, and to continue to craft our vision for family and consumer sciences so we can design the best experience for our, participa our participants to be able to think, create, and ultimately learn. So step two of this process. <clears throat> is to explore the possibilities. And I think that this is where I really get excited about what I can do as a professional in family and consumer sciences. But exploring the possibilities isn't where we stop. So we might spend uh, some time brainstorming with a colleague and we start creating new ideas. Or maybe we're searching to see what's out there utilizing the web. So we come up with a list of, of possibilities in our mind, or maybe it's right before we fall asleep at night. We're still thinking about the day and what we could do uh, with youth or adults. But after we come up with a few possibilities, we really have to develop a prototype for what we're going to implement. Because those possibilities don't transition into reality until we start creating and developing the materials and resources. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. Um, even though it's a course that we teach as a general education course, um, we've been able to take it from 60 students to 160, stu 160 students. And we could teach it to 300 students, if I was feeling really brave. Um, but really being able to prototype, develop, include the possibilities into the instruction that I'm providing 
to students across Utah State University campus, I have to be able to communicate it in a way that students want to learn it. So um, on the left-hand side, you'll see that's a syllabus, which a syllabus, when I say that word, you think of something probably very traditional. And so I've utilized that, designed it a little bit differently, so it's a more interesting for the students to read. And I can use it as a tool to promote what I think the possibilities are in family and consumer sciences. And then divide it out and create a different graphics and icons and um, resources to direct the students through the experience. But then those ideas that you have, the workshops that you put together, are you documenting them? Do you grab pictures that can be used to illustrate what you're accomplishing? So specifically, we do this Recycle Redesign Fashion Show, and it's brought in thousands of people to attend the event. And this past semester, we actually uh, connected with Black Diamond, an outdoor gear company that's launched a new line of apparel for men. And then in the fall, they're going to launch outdoor clothing for women. And the creative director, who formerly was a designer for Patagonia, came and judged the event. So we're able to use the event to promote and communicate the possibilities that we can accomplish with family and consumer sciences. And the pictures actually on the screen of the two individuals, those are our high school students that we've worked with in our secondary programs. And the teacher is a photographer. And so she's been able to capture what the students are doing. So this isn't just something that we do on the Utah State University campus. It's something that's happening in secondary classrooms around uh, the state as well. So taking one idea and seeing how it's blossomed and transferred <laughs> into other locations across the state. And here are some of the flyers that we've used, taking pictures of students in recycled fashion. Um, and it draws a lot of attention and gets people thinking about what could be. And these are some of the, the fashions that have been created and utilized and won awards um, for the assignment. And then this is a screen capture from a presentation that I did for Zappos on education couture. So we have couture for clothing for us to wear, but why don't we create couture for educational experiences, the best, most coveted experiences that we can provide through family and consumer sciences? So transforming our teaching and learning with that design element. So it's time to sketch for part two, step two. What are the possibilities in your area? What are some of the ideas, the new ideas that you want to develop for workshops and classes that connect to things that you've seen as important in your county? So connecting to those possibilities and developing those prototypes. So take a couple minutes or a couple seconds, I guess, and explore the possibilities. What are the prototypes that you need assistance developing or want to develop for your professional practice? Now, once you've got those possibilities listed, it's time to edit. And this step in the process can actually take us quite a bit of time. Um, writing articles, you know that editing what you've written can be time consuming, getting feedback from individuals, the review process. It's very important to make sure that we're providing something that's valid and reliable, and it helps us to create insight on our professional practice and be reflective practitioners. Uh, what, how can we do that? How do we edit thoughtfully and create insight as educators to develop these new programs that we want to create? Professional development is an important way for us to do that, and I know many of you participate in that, and um, professional memberships as well can provide us with the resources, or maybe not the physical resources, but the network the individuals that we need to review those materials and help to put the stamp of approval on what we're creating. And then also the resources and references that we use. 
are there are lots of new resources and references that are be, being created created and here's one that i thought that might be interesting to you the family and consumer sciences education association produces monographs as frequently as they can get authors to submit proposals for monographs they will review and it's a blind review process and publish the monographs showcasing different model, models. And these are something that you could develop as extension professionals and have uh, peer reviewed and published. They're 40 to 50 pages. And I'm working actually with Dr. Brain on one looking at sustainability education and family and consumer sciences. And it's been approved. So, so we're in the writing phase of um, putting it together to be uh, to go through the final review process. So this one, a model for ob obesity education curriculum for family and consumer sciences. And I know that you're working on that issue. So this could be something that you could do to help with the tenure and promotion process or to communicate what you've been successfully completing in your counties. Another resource, and we've talked about this at the nutrition conference, but iBooks, creating e-textbooks. Um, pulling together resources and materials, um, creating apps for that. That's something that's been discussed a lot at the annual conference, and we have opportunities and support to do that. But we can, in Family and Consumer Sciences, create those applications that individuals can use on a daily basis, on a regular basis, whether it's for an iPad or an iPhone. Um, we can be the information resource for individuals instead of going and Googling it all the time, they can come to us and find that information. So it's time to sketch again. How are you going to edit in order to uh, improve your professional pra practice? Where are you going to get the references? Who are you going to have be your resource or your support system to give you feedback and help you provide um, the latest and greatest programs in your county to continue to provide because you're already doing those wonderful things. So looking at critical thinking, problem solving, are there ways that you can refine your instruction, your workshops to be able to address those types of skills and the creativity piece as well. So now we're coming on the fourth and final step that I think is, is a lot of fun. Collecting obsessively. I don't know if any of you are collectors of things, whether it's my fabric stash that I'm adding to consistently, or you know the kitchen equipment that I'm using, or toys for my son that are age appropriate in the child development area. It's easy for us to collect those things, but collecting our ideas. So maybe you start one of those smash books and as you're walking around your, your community, you find something that you could connect to as an extension professional and you collect that as an idea and then implement that into your programming. Look for the meaning and ways that you can connect individuals in your county to the activities that we present in Family and Consumer Sciences. So we should always be, and you probably already are doing this, but collecting, considering new strategies and ways that we can connect our workshops and our teaching to everyday life. So putting the profession up here, um, reminding you of this. So if we look at this, finding resources and materials in each of those content areas, that's where the collecting starts. So I'll show you some examples. So social media allows us to collect I find I'm collecting all the time on Instagram, taking pictures of things that I like and I want to remember. And organizations are doing this as well. Magazines that you subscribe to. So um, the woman on the front of Fast Company Magazine is a creative director um, for J. Crew, And so I can read the article about what she's doing and collect that magazine and might, I might be inspired by something that she said. Or Patagonia has a new video series on on worn wear, uh, clothing from the past and the stories that our clothing is telling. And on Twitter, we might find something new and innovative. And so we collect that as an idea. And one last video that I wanna show you, we can use these videos and these ideas for teaching and challenging individuals to think of the possibility. So have you ever thought about the color of the clothing that you're wearing? Do you? Are you driven by color? I choose my clothing based on the color and when spring hits, I'm hungry for 
new colors and bright colors as opposed to the black that I might consistently wear in the winter. And so this next clip shows you the process that fabric goes through to be dyed in these different color palettes and they have a lot of fun with it. So there are a lot of these videos out there that you could use. New York City, fashion capital of the world. Here, J. Cruz color creators invent more than 100 new hues each season. One might think 310 shades of pink would be enough for these people. It's not, because they are color crazy. How do they do it? I'll show you. First stop, the design team searches for inspiration. Fruit, flowers, fine wine, office supplies. They pick and choose swatches to select colors that pop. The best colors are named good, good, not so good, very nice. The colors approved and swatches are sent here, where beauty is second nature. Cappuccino, pastries, amore. Onto the color lab, colors are matched with the best fabric for optimum saturation and shade. It's just a little advanced hydro color theory, dynamic algorithmics, state-of-the-art-ish computing, and beakers. Lots and lots of beakers. Fabric is dyed and sent back to New York. If they like what they see, they send it back to Italy and give it to this man, the charming Luigi. Please continue. Luigi loads 100 yards of fine double cloth wool from this guy into the Dye Master 5000. Dye, buttons, pipes, more dye. Don't worry, that's normal. I think that's normal. And there you have it. Vibrant color comes to life. It's art meets science meets a guy named Luigi. Ah, yeah, how can I forget Pietro and Fabrizio and all the rest of the team that bring you the brightest, most fabulous double cloth coats season after season. So it gives us an interesting perspective on the process that our clothing goes through to become that vibrant, amazing color. And I was intrigued and interested. So it brings clothing to the forefront and connects it to science and art and there's math in there as well which is is useful for our, our programs because we're covering those areas but then the teaching strategies that we use the strategies that we use to engage people and i'm just going to briefly present these because i want to allow some time for questions uh, and i would be happy to elaborate and provide you some more resources on these strategies but problem-based learning posing a problem and having a group of individuals go through and come up with a variety of solutions group investigation working in teams collaborative teams to solve issues and problems or to create a demonstration so you don't necessarily have to provide all of the information but challenging individuals and participants to come up with ideas and share their information as well practical reasoning is another strategy direct instruction which is lecture mastery learning where there are stations for individuals to go through to master content or information, inductive thinking. Synetics is where we use analogies. So when we're talking about something, um, whether it's food or relationships, so we can have our participants develop analogies to explain what they know or to present what they know about a subject. So for example, describe your relationship by creating an analogy. My relationship is like a rose. It blooms when it's fed with water and given support and structure, etc. I don't know, that was just last minute thinking on my feet. Concept attainment, role play, creating an experience for your participants to role play, cooperative learning, and also demonstration can be a common strategy that we use in family and consumer sciences as well. So how are we telling our story? Utilizing marketing and social media, presenting information, using um, websites and resources in innovative ways, Facebook, Pinterest, um, Twitter, YouTube, infographics, we can use those and have individuals help us to edit them and create um, a story on an issue that we're addressing. And 4-H is another excellent way for us to communicate with youth and really show how we're making a difference utilizing family and consumer sciences. So the last time to sketch, 
Um, what have you collect obsessively to discover meaning? What are some of your great resources? Maybe it's your Pinterest board where you're gathering all of these ideas and resources and materials and videos. You can connect to videos. Um, what are you collecting at this point that you want to use to create meaning for your participants? What resources are out there that you want to make sure that people know about? And then when that all comes together, each of these four steps we can see that there's this whole cycle that we go through it again and again to refine what we do in family and consumer sciences and ultimately to change the world and improve the quality of life for individuals and families. So what are you going to create with your pencil for family and consumer sciences? What questions do you have? <laughs> Too early for questions? Sometimes you need to process, think about it. And maybe you'll have some questions later. Lindsay, this is Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. So I have a question. It's not what you asked, but the question I have is, what was that classroom um, situation so we can watch the end of it? That was interesting. Yeah. So Edutopia, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Edutopia, um, E-D-U-T-O-P-I-A. They have a lot of resources for developing instruction, workshops, um, teaching, learning, using technology. So they have put out this series on Remake Your Class. And so I can provide you with a link. It's um, a collaboration between Edutopia and Third Teacher Plus. That would be fun, thank you. Yeah. And they have a series of three videos. So you can see the whole process of how they've transformed the space. And they got the students involved in remaking that space. And you can even okay, go to you. Third Teacher Plus, their website. If you search for Third Teacher Plus, they have a website that shows you all of the different resources and, and projects that they've taken on at different universities, different schools. Excellent. OK. And also, can you put back the question about what have you collected obsessively? I, I didn't get that all written down. That Let's one. See. Yep. What have you collected okay, obsessively you. to discover meaning? OK. So one of the reasons why I presented this this way is you could do that in your presentation. As, as you're providing new information, participants are enjoying what you're saying, but we have to give them time to process it. So having a time out, if you will, to sketch and draw down the ideas, it helps them to create that meaning. And then when we go back to our desks, we have that information and can continue to apply it to our professional practice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like a copy of this handout, I'd be happy to share that with you as well. That would be great. Thank you. I have kind of a discussion question. This is Lacey. Yeah. Um, I find it sometimes difficult to even find room sometimes for my programming. What are some of the techniques that you're aware of or other agents use to get places to be, but also to create the, the welcoming environments when you're kind of using rooms on loan, like they aren't really dedicated you to are. extension. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. And I find when I've had different events that I've had to do, because um, in my professional history, I've been a secondary teacher, I've worked at other institutions, and, and sometimes even finding space for, we have candidates interviewing on campus, for us to have a nice breakfast and discussion is difficult. So I think you have to identify the resources in your community. 
What are places that you like to go to that might have enough space? And then develop a relationship with that organization or that entity. So then after you get to know what their needs are, you can say, well, I can help you with that need. And I would enjoy the opportunity to connect more people to your space. So I think just finding those partnerships and true collaborative opportunities to say, I can do this for you. Would there be an opportunity for me to rent your space or utilize your space? Thanks. Yeah. When I was a student, we used to use hotel lobbies. Right. Because you could just go in like you were staying there. Yeah. Scott just recommended hotel lobbies as well because people could just come and go in those areas and you could have a casual meeting. I know that one of my favorite restaurants in Logan, I was eating there and I thought, wow, this would be a great place to have a conference meeting. Well, they do that. <laughs> they allow for that and they have a person who's identified to organize it. So it actually made my life easier because that was something that they provide as a place that you can rent and they serve the food and it's good food. So then you have a successful event, right? If the food's good, you're on your way. Lindsay, how do you, um, we've been working, I've been working with Karen Allen and we're looking at the food science right. and doing some uh, curriculum for 4-H and I know she's working in the classrooms also. How do you, in the clothing and textiles, um, traditionally in the state of Utah, um, in 4-H, we've really been construction. Um, right. How do we branch out and see the other um, opportunities that are available in the clothing and textiles areas besides just construction? Does that design, um, <laughs> those kinds of things, where do you see us going? Where do we what do we want to do to, to get that interest level? So, um, well, there are a variety of different ways, of course, that we could go with clothing and textiles. Um, the place that I go to to find some inspiration, even though it's a secondary resource, we have national standards for family and consumer sciences. The National Association of State Administrators for Family and Consumer Sciences have collectively developed these standards. And in the standards are all of these excellent ideas for what we can do as educators with our workshops, with our programs. So a big focus right now, I think, is uh, looking at careers. So if we can provide an opportunity for students to explore careers in family and consumer sciences. So if we're looking at a food science experience, what are some careers that they might be able to explore? Um, in clothing and textiles, what could be some career opportunities that um, maybe they're not going to construct something, but maybe they learn one piece of that career or a part of that. So that's why I showed that video on the fabric dyeing process because that illustrates careers that are involved that we might not think of every day as contributing to clothing and textiles. The fabric design piece, taking art and connecting it. Anytime we can reinforce science, technology, engineering, and math through 4-H and family and consumer sciences, it's seen as a very valuable experience for students. So can we do science experiments with clothing and textiles related content? We could do a burn lab experience. Now you'd have to facilitate that in an area that has ventilation, but that gives students a new perspective about the clothing that they're wearing and the fibers, um, looking at agriculture all the way to what we're wearing. So Debbie, I think there are lots of, and I'd be happy to brainstorm some of those ideas because I'm sure you've got some great ideas too, where we can move beyond that construction piece. 
I think that's great. We'll have to, we need to do that. I Okay. For sure. Let's do. Because I know our secondary programs are teachers who teach clothing um, and textiles concepts. They want new ideas too. And our programs need those ideas. Well, I really appreciate your time that you've given this morning to participate in this. And feel free to contact me with your questions. Uh, and let's develop some partnerships and really change the world, continue to change the world for family and consumer sciences. Have a lovely day. And we'll see you soon.